I'd like to ask our, our leaders in the interfaith and the justice community if they could respond to what you've heard from these young people. Reverend Rowe? Yes, I would like to respond to each one of the young people that have uh, spoken. I agree wholeheartedly with each one of you. We do need to have innovative programs. First of all, schools need to be improved in the curriculum. I don't think so much of shutting down schools and maybe changing the way we teach and educate our young people. I believe young people want to learn. I believe they have an interest to learn. I think it's what's the environment that has afforded them and what is open and what options they have. Partnerships, collaboration, community, it is very much needed in the educational arena of our young people. And I could talk forever because I'm a preacher, so I'm going to share it with my other panelists. <laughs> you know, I'd like to uh, add something uh, that Eric said, and, and it's so true, and it really truly is the message that I believe needs to get out to the young kids, and that is, you know, before you, a 15-year-old grabs for that gun, to pick up that gun to shoot somebody, they need to really think uh, about what that action is going to do. It's not just about shooting someone else and taking another life, but if you, if you are just selfishly thinking of yourself, you need to think of who's the one person in your life that probably has the most influence and you probably have the most love for, your mother. And that's something that I think you should think of before you pick up that gun and before you decide to shoot somebody is what effect does that have, not just on the person you're about to hurt or kill, uh, but on, on your own family, on your own life, on your, on your mother, because trying gang cases that I did for years, I can tell you who comes to court for that person, for that defendant. It's not the gangbangers. They're not sitting in the hard seats. It's your mother, it's your grandmother, it's your, it's your aunt and uncle, it's your father. That's who's sitting in the hard seats there who love you and who support you. And mm -hmm. so the message really, you know, the awareness that you talked about is it needs to be out there, that kids have to be aware of the consequences that that one shot is going to have on your entire life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just like to um, add that I agree with uh, what the students were saying, um, but I would like to say that some of the issues like substance abuse, domestic violence in the household, child abuse, both physical and sexual, have a profound effect on the violence in the community. And at times when we don't address those, mm -hmm. when funding is cut um, to address those mm -hmm. type of issues, um, and we're dealing with the, the uh, symptoms, mm -hmm. which is the killing and so forth. So it's not just drugs, as you know, uh, one of the students said, and guns, but it's those other underlying issues. And also, sometimes when you talk to uh, youth at various forums, they bring up those issues on why they can't do well at school because there's substance abuse issues in their household, and they are taking care of their siblings in the right. household. Um, and so these are factors that we cannot ignore. And I think when we do, um, don't pay much attention to them, uh, the attention that it deserves, that you do also have uh, leads to violence. So it's not, I don't see a, a one solution. It's a multi-layered approach um, that deals with those issues as well as uh, gun laws, like Miguel said, you know, as well as awareness, like Eric said, whether it's, it's community awareness, but also training for uh, police officers and judges and lawyers, et cetera. It's not one solution, it's many solutions. Yes. Father Curran, your view on this and how the interfaith community can get actively engaged? Well, I think it's a question of breakdown of community. I think so often what our young people share in many ways are a cry out for us to keep the web uh, of the fabric. We speak to uh, mentioning uh, a divided home. We need to have significant programs in our communities that respond to the divided home, that hear the spouse who's crying out for help, or goes home at night and sees the exp experience of being threatened. That's a model for our children and that affects our streets. These young people are reminding us that they need the help and they need the supports. And we need as community to see the ways in which we provide those supports and name what is breaking our communities. The guns not breaking it is the people that are carrying the guns and the models that they see that that's their only way out. It's the only solution. We believe that there's a better solution. Healthier solutions matter. Reverend Saffold, as you look at the situation and you see these young people 
are speaking from their hearts as well as their minds. What do you say to their hearts? Well, um, I say to their hearts that um, keep hope alive for certain and uh, that their, their pleas aren't going unheard. I was sitting here thinking about um, the proverbial, the rocks crying out. Um, these children are the rocks crying out and uh, we have to hear and respond appropriately. Um, when, when they spoke about the hood versus neighborhood, that was very challenging because I think that's where a breakdown is. Uh, when you ask, <clears throat> uh, especially men, uh, when you ask uh, what you fight for your country, and certainly in our context, some, most would probably say no. And, and, and I know why, and I understand that, but the deal is you don't fight for your community, so how can you embrace fighting for a country? So I think that's part of the struggle too, where men are absent in the struggle uh, in, the, in the homes, uh, taking control of community, giving leadership, and um, bringing safety into the environment so the children can go back and forth to school. So I think that's critical, um, making sure that men play a vital role and be present uh, in the lives of, of, of their children. Miguel, how does it feel to have the responses that you have heard from the elders in the community hearing what you're saying? It feels, it feels good, like, um, I like that they talk to us and and they see us as, as like another human being and not just a 17, 16 year old who, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of adults out there who just look at you and then they just see a 16, 17 year old and they don't see you as another human being who has a capable mind of um, having mature ideas and responsibilities. So I really appreciate this. Thank you all, we appreciate your candor, honesty, and we'll be back. She was a very beautiful, loving person, very caring. She had lots of friends. 14-year-old Starkeisha Reed was standing in her home when a gangbanger opened fire outside with an AK-47. You don't think about burying a child. You think about their graduation, you think about their marriage, you think about college, you think about their career. All of these things as you're raising them as a child and as a baby. But to think about what they're going to wear when they go to the morgue, no parent thinks about that. They're taking away young lives. Starkeisha was going to be a doctor. Denise Reed sees how the cycle of violence is created by silence. But if your child is involved with something that you know is illegal, that you know is questionable, seek help, whether it be through clergy, the police, CAPS, um, a friend, neighbor, the school, you must get involved. Welcome to a town hall discussion on youth violence. In our previous segment, we discussed defining the issues of youth violence. We also had an opportunity to observe some statistical data provided by Professor Jean Ludwig of the University of Chicago about violence in other major cities. It is important that we take a look at present day issues facing the parents of young people. We have here today representatives from the police, the courts, and parents who will be discussing their concerns and the impact of violence. 